Good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this 29th day of April. It is day 120 in our journey through the Bible. I'm glad you are here. I'm glad that you're showing up. Man, so much of life is just showing up, getting in the way of goodness. Sometimes if you just do that, that can make a huge difference in our lives. And so good on you for showing up today, for getting in the way of something that's good for your soul. Time to listen, time to reflect, time to consider things that are true about you, about God, about our world. All that stuff happens here every day at the DRB. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for being a part of this. Today we are into the book of 2 Samuel chapters 4 and 5. That's where we're going to start. Then we go on to Psalm 139 and we will finish our reading in Matthew chapter 16. And I'm glad you're here. Did I already say that? Well, doesn't hurt to say it again. Father, help us to see 2 Samuel chapter 4. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard about Abner's death at Hebron, he lost all courage, and all Israel became paralyzed with fear. Now there were two brothers, Bana and Rakab, who were captains of Ishbosheth's raiding parties. They were sons of Rimon, a member of the tribe of Benjamin who lived in Biroth. The town of Biroth is now part of Benjamin's territory, because the original people of Biroth fled to Gitaim, where they still live as foreigners. Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him, and he became crippled. One day, Rechab and Bana, the sons of Ramon, from Biroth, went to Ishbosheth's house around noon as he was taking his midday rest. The doorkeeper, who had been sifting wheat, became drowsy and fell asleep, so Rakab and Bana slipped past her. They went into the house and found Ishbosheth sleeping on his bed. They struck and killed him and cut off his head. Then, taking his head with them, they fled across the Jordan Valley through the night. When they arrived at Hebron, they presented Ishbosheth's head to David. Look, they exclaimed to the king, here's the head of Ishbosheth the son of your enemy Saul, who tried to kill you. Today the Lord has given my lord the king revenge on Saul and his entire family. But David said to Rechab and Bana, The Lord who saved me from all my enemies is my witness. Someone once told me that Saul is dead, thinking he was bringing me good news. But I seized him and killed him at Ziklag. That's the reward I gave him for his news. How much more should I reward evil men who have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed? Shouldn't I hold you responsible for his blood and rid the earth of you? So David ordered his young men to kill them, and they did. They cut off their hands and feet and hung their bodies beside the pool in Hebron. Then they took Ishbosheth's head and buried it in Abner's tomb in Hebron. 2 Samuel 5 Then all the tribes of Israel went to David at Hebron and told him, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past when Saul was our king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord told you, You will be the shepherd of my people Israel. You will be Israel's leader. So there at Hebron, King David made a covenant between the Lord and all the elders of Israel, and they anointed him king of Israel. David was thirty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years in all. He had reigned over Judah from Hebron for seven years and six months, and from Jerusalem. He reigned over all Israel and Judah for thirty-three years. David then led his men to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. The Jebusites taunted David, saying, You'll never get in here. Even the blind and lame could keep you out. But the Jebusites thought that they were safe. But David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the City of David. On the day of the attack, David said to his troops, 
I hate those lame and blind Jebusites. Whoever attacks them should strike by going into the city through the water tunnel. That is the origin of the saying, The blind and lame may not enter the house. So David made the fortress his home, and he called it the City of David. He extended the city, starting at the supporting terraces and working inward. And David became more and more powerful because the Lord, the God of heaven's armies, was with him. Then King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David, along with cedar timber and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built David a palace. And David realized that the Lord had confirmed him as king over Israel and had blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. After moving from Hebron to Jerusalem, David married more concubines and wives, and they had more sons and daughters. These are the names of David's sons who were born in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elashua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elashima, Eliada, and Elephelet. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces to capture him. But David was told they were coming, so he went into the stronghold. The Philistines arrived and spread out across the valley of Raphaim. So David asked the Lord, Should I go out and fight the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord replied to David, Yes, go ahead, I will certainly hand them over to you. So David went to Baal Perazim and defeated the Philistines there. The Lord did it, David exclaimed. He burst through my enemies like a raging flood. So he named that place Baal Perazim, which means the Lord who burst through. The Philistines had abandoned their idols there, so David and his men confiscated them. But after a while, the Philistines returned again and spread out across the valley of Raphaim. And again, David asked the Lord what to do. Do not attack them straight on, the Lord replied. Instead, circle around behind and attack them near the poplar trees. When you hear a sound like marching feet in the tops of the poplar trees, be on alert. That will be the signal that the Lord is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. So David did what the Lord commanded, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Geser. Psalm 139 For the choir director, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down and stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day in my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O Lord! They cannot be numbered. I cannot even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. O God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers! They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name, O Lord. Shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred. For your enemies are my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out everything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Matthew 16 One day the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. He replied, 
You know the saying, red sky at night means fair weather tomorrow. Red sky in the morning means foul weather all day. You know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky. But you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I'll give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Then Jesus left them and went away. Later, after they crossed to the other side of the lake, the disciples discovered that they had forgotten to bring any bread. Watch out, Jesus warned them. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. At this, they began to argue with each other, because they hadn't brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, You have so little faith. Why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Don't you understand even yet? Don't you remember the five thousand I fed with five loaves and the baskets of leftovers you picked up? Or the four thousand I fed with seven loaves and the large baskets of leftovers you picked up? Why can't you understand that I'm not talking about bread? So again I say beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then at last they understood that he wasn't speaking about the yeast in bread but about the deceptive teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law, He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap for me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my followers, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing right here will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And now may the Son of Man, who is coming, may he now give his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Amen. It's a dangerous trap. That's what Jesus calls it to see things only from your own point of view, from your own perspective, it's a dangerous trap. And Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. It's a dangerous trap to see things from your own point of view and not God's. It's dangerous to hold on to your life and your agenda apart from God. Later on in this passage, Jesus says, 
If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. If you demand to hold on to your own way, to make this life a project all about you, your ego, your comfort, your ambition, position, reputation, or pleasure, then you've fallen into a trap and you will ultimately lose your life. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Asks Jesus. But Jesus gives us a way out. Jesus himself frees us from this trap. He tells us that we must live in light of the cross. We must live in the reality of what has become of us through the cross. You have been restored. You have been forgiven. You have been made new there on the cross with Christ. The way to be free from this dangerous trap is through the victory of the cross. The cross declares what God has done. The cross proclaims what you've become. <laughs> Wonderful. It is here in Christ that your soul is made new. To pursue your life apart from Christ is to forfeit your soul. It's a failure to see what God has done and what you have now become. You are a child of God, my friend. May God help you to see it so that you can begin to live it, to discover your true self, to discover Him. On the cross, we see what it is to love, to give of oneself, to radically forgive others and to suffer alongside with others. When we do that, we become fully alive. So don't fall into the trap. Don't live only from your point of view. Live from the perspective of the cross. That's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Let's continue now in a time of prayer. Feel free to read along with these prayers in the show notes of today's podcast and meditate on these words that are being spoken over you, your family, and our world. And now, let us pray. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, Make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved, as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, hey friends, thank you for showing up today here at the DRB. You showed up for yourself, and not only for yourself, but you showed up for those that you love. That's right. You tending to your soul is a blessing not only to you. It's a blessing that goes far beyond you. No, it has its effects on those that you love on your neighbors because that's what love does love moves beyond itself and that's such a good thing so good on you thanks for showing up here in my part of the world it is a beautiful day we've got some sunshine we've got a blue sky we've got plants that are starting to do their thing flowers are in abundance and man it feels so good and I want to get myself out and take a bit of a walk today get my legs moving my arms moving my lungs breathing that's just part of what I have on the agenda for the day and I hope that your agenda involves some physical activity if it's possible I know that for all it is not but and if it is that too is one important way to show up for yourself Well, all this showing up talk, I plan on showing up tomorrow. That's my plan. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. Your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this. That love showed up for you. Because you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty? I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care. Bye-bye.